with Polish, I understand podcast series, but yet when I communicate, I certainly don't communicate that way. <laughs> But I feel yeah. like it's too simple that I still need to think about what I want to say most of the time. So, you know, long story short, I'm trying to get more into understanding if there's a way to practice output. You know what I mean? Hi, Joe. Hello. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you. And well, first of all, welcome to the podcast. It's, uh, it's 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 a pleasure to have you on. And to get things started, I'm curious: were you always interested in languages, or was there a point in which you started to realize that you really love learning languages? Uh yes. So I have always been interested in learning languages. Um, actually, the first language that I tried to learn uh, was German. Yeah. Um, so my, my mother, uh, studied German in university for her degree. And so we always kind of experimented with learning German at home when I was a kid. And so, you know, I do still know some, not very much, but, um, and so that was always like in my life plan was to learn German, learn other languages, but, um, yeah, I never, I don't know, I never knew anybody else who was interested in languages. I never knew anybody who knew any other languages other than English. Like, I grew up in a small town in the country, and so it was very much not on anyone's radar um, whatsoever. And so I think, I, I think I've said this before, but, like, I had no idea both like how easy and how hard it would be to learn another language like okay i think i thought that if i just ever like just buckled down and did the work because i've always been very hobby fickle like i've always jumped from hobby to hobby without mastering things like and so i think i always thought just well if i just like really try for like a couple months or something like mm -hmm. you know i'll learn it and so, uh, yeah, that obviously never happened. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even honestly remember why I decided to really do Spanish, but it was um, kind of a, a point in my life around 2019, the end of 2019, where I finally had the time to start learning a language. And so I just pretty much was like, well, I'm going to do Spanish. And then here we are. Boom. Oh. And um, do you try to learn it the traditional way at first? Because that's pretty much what most you know, people do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because yeah. that's that's what we got when we were in school, right? That's the is yeah. we didn't see an alternative, right? So yeah, yeah. So I started with a, an online course at a, a community college in the U.S. It's like a kind of like a technical college, mm -hmm. and so I just did one term of online and it was okay i mean it was fine i definitely learned from it but I, it was very much you know the kind of learning where you're like okay a sitter is irregular and so i'm gonna be uh yo i'll go in like all the mm. overthinking everything and nothing's coming naturally whatsoever and so, yeah, I think I initially signed up for Spanish too, you know, in the middle of that and then dropped it without, you know, before the semester had even ended because I was like, I don't like this. Like, I don't want to learn this way. It's turning into a huge chore and not something that I want to do. And so I was like, if I keep doing this, not only do I feel like I'm not learning that effectively, but I'm also going to not even want to learn anymore. And so, yeah, I only did the one semester of that. And then from there, it was honestly probably another year before I really, really um, started learning with comprehensible input effectively. Like, and it was during that year that I started my first YouTube channel, um, which was books and language learning combined. And nice. so, yeah, it was... You know, I was watching YouTube, I was watching 
you know, Steve Kaufman videos and all of that kind of stuff. But I still, it was, I don't like learner content very much. And so it was very difficult for me to get from, and it still is with other languages, to get from can't understand anything to can understand enough to do fun things, um, Mm. or at least things that I find fun. And so I think that's kind of where I was stuck. I wasn't pushing over that kind of hill in order to start enjoying it a little bit more. And so I finally, re- I mean, mostly I just wasn't spending enough time. Like, again, going back to thinking that this wasn't going to be that hard. Like, I think this was kind of when I realized it actually is going to be not hard, not difficult, but time. Mm-hmm. And so then I, you know, actually started putting in hours. And that was when, you know, a, the breakthroughs started happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, just, it's gonna take time, like you said. It's not that it's gonna be hard. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not. I mean, it, it's it's a difficult work because I was just thinking about it that it's not hard in the sense of that you're gonna suffer through it. Yes, I personally believe you're never gonna learn anything if it does the process. Mm-hmm. But it's it might be hard in the sense of the doubts you're going to have along the way, the moments in which you're going to doubt yourself, the moments mainly, and we'll talk about it later, but the moment you want to start communicating, but you can't yet. Now, so, much, so it might be hard in that sense, right? But not in the sense of the traditional way of just having to struggle through every class and not enjoying it. And, you know. and, uh, and it's like mentally taxing, like you're your attempting to understand at the very beginning is so oh, yeah. exhausting to your brain. Like you can listen to a foreign language for like three minutes and it's just like your brain energy is just like going down mm-hmm. so rapidly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it's just building up that mental strength and tolerance for it. Yeah, absolutely. So then was it out of desperation i was gonna say but out of that not not enjoying the process at all and you know seeing that it wasn't effective at all once again that you started just researching online and you came across youtube videos or was it because in my case that was pretty much what happened like i started just looking for different videos, books, I, I was just trying to understand how the language mechanism works, right? Because again, all most people now is the traditional way because that's what we all got growing up, right? So it's, it's hard to think there's an alternative to it. So I just started researching like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was similar. Like I've always been a YouTube watcher. Um, mm-hmm. So partially it was just you know, the algorithm kind of figuring out that I was interested in this and suggesting things to me. And then as well, yeah, trying to find, you know, better ways of doing it. And I think also like I had this idea and I think even uh, probably in my earliest videos, you'll see me still saying this at that time. I had this idea that like I knew about the concept of like reading books and watching things and everything in order to learn but I felt like you had to get to like a certain level and maybe not as high as they talk about in traditional classes, but I still would think, well, I need to get, you know, some more vocabulary before I'm going to be able to do that or I need to do this and do that. And, you know, I still think that that's a way to do it. Like you absolutely can, if especially if you don't have a very high tolerance for ambiguity, I think that can be good to try to help yourself out in that way but it's obviously not essential and i think yeah i was really trying to like with my i remember thinking that with the spanish one class that i was like well i'll do that and then i'll be that much closer to being able to transition into reading books or into watching things and i mean again to some extent that is true like i did learn vocabulary that helped me do that but also i think I also learned things that probably to this day are still impacting my ability to speak because, again, I still do some of that 
trying to think back to how to conjugate things that I wish that I didn't do. Like, yeah. Right. And do you think that's mainly because of those early experiences? Yes. Yeah. That, it, mm, that it, in a way sort of teaches you to consciously think about form as opposed to meaning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I don't know how much of that is like, I don't know. I was just talking about this the other day on a Discord, um, asking people. So I hear people say all the time, like, in the language learning space, especially comprehensible input, that they'll say, like, I said this thing and I didn't even know I knew how to say it, or I didn't even know I knew that or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I do not have that experience at all. Like, I... I understand things that I have no idea how I understand all the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't usually say things that I'm like, oh, I didn't know I knew that or like, and I don't know if that's partially just people's brains working differently. Um, cause this is something I'm super interested in that I've talked about some on my channel is like, I don't think in words generally, like, um, okay. so like having a train of thought. I have a train of thought. There are thoughts happening all the time, but it's not words. Like I don't have a, an inner monologue or whatever. And so I don't know if that's part of it where I just don't store words as well as some people because of that. And so my thoughts aren't popping out fully formed. Like I always, I always have to think about what I want to say before I say it, because that's, mm. I don't know. That's just how my brain works. So I think there are probably a lot more individual differences that make a big impact in our language learning than we even like consider. Hmm. Yeah, I think I know what you mean because to some extent that happens to me as well. And it's part of the reason why recently, so to, to put things in perspective, you know, I started with my project when I came across Comprehensible Input. I loved it. It made so much sense to me right away. And up until the last couple of months, I'd say, I've been pretty radical about believing in it above, uh, above everything. And <laughs> I, I, st I still think it's the way to go. Like, you, you can't learn a language without Comprehensible Input. That's the, to me, it's still the most important thing. But I'm starting to get a, a bit obsessed in the in a good way, you know, meaning that I'm doing a lot of research and trying to understand how it works when it comes to the speaking part. Because the funny thing is with English, I find like I'm past that, that part that I don't need to think about what I'm going to say. But with other languages like Italian or Portuguese or even Polish, because I live in Poland. So... I can understand, especially Italian and Portuguese, I understand pretty much 100% of what I'm listening to, reading, or talking to people in the street. But then when it comes to speaking, and I understand it's always going to be behind. I, I always talk about it. Like, our ability to understand is always, always going to be ahead. But I feel like the gap is too high with some of those languages because I just can't understand everything. And mm -hmm. even with, because with Italian and Portuguese, you can make the case that because Spanish is my native language, that helps, right? And that's why it's so comprehensible. But with Polish, I understand podcast series, but yet when I communicate, I certainly don't communicate that way. <laughs> but I yeah. feel like it's too simple that I still need to think about what I want to say most of the time. So, you know, long story short, I'm trying to get more into understanding if there's a way to practice output. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. th that's the main thing that I'm still, not still, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think about it from a different perspective. Like, is there anything we can do to improve that? Not just input. Know what I mean? Because yeah. yeah. I, I was one of those that I believe like it's all input, like that's going to lead into, into being able to communicate later on. And again, like I said, I still believe it's the most important thing, but I have the feeling that there might be something that could be done in order to improve the way you communicate, because I'm feeling that. Yeah, I feel like I'm in exactly the same place where I'm kind of starting to try different things. You know, I've been taking speaking classes for 
um, like group classes for, I don't know, eight months or something now. And I mean, I can speak, like I can get my point across. I can talk about things, but I make incredibly basic grammar errors. Um, and, and I just don't think of words like, you know, exactly like you were saying, like I have a massive vocabulary passively in Spanish. I can watch just about anything. I read literature classics in Spanish. And of course there are words I don't know, but like I can function completely fine from an input perspective in Spanish, but I sound ridiculous. (laughs) Like, I mean, I sound okay, but, uh, um, and I just don't see, and I don't, the biggest thing to me is, and it's hard to gauge your own progress, obviously, yep. but I don't see myself improving very rapidly in speaking. Cause you know, that's what they always tell you is, of course, you're going to be awkward at first. You're going to struggle at first, mm-hmm. but you're going to catch up really quickly because you have all that input. Right. And I just don't see that happening with myself. Like it's not getting that much easier. And so, you know, I've been trying to start writing because I'm a much stronger writer than speaker in my native language. So it makes sense that that would also be the case in Spanish as well. And I'm also thinking I might start shadowing more Mm because I I haven't done that at all. And so I thought maybe if I just practice saying the things, even if I'm not coming up with saying them, maybe Mm -hmm. I will. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm in exactly the same place where I'm starting to feel like there is this gap that... And sure, it probably will fill in on its own, but I'm already four over four years into learning Spanish. Right, right, right. And I, I'd like my uh, gap to get small and then yeah. in between by speaking yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I'm extremely self-aware, so if it was lack of patience, I, I would be self-aware enough to tell me to tell myself the truth. But in mm-hmm. some of those languages, it's not the case. Just like you said with Spanish, so. I feel like things like shadowing, like you said, or like listen and repeat, things like that. Like I- I'm trying to read more about it so I get a better understanding of how we can help you, right? Because mm-hmm. for example, when it comes to pronunciation, I feel like it can help you right away. Because yeah. it's one thing, the-, the way things sound in your head compared to how then you actually output them mm-hmm. is different <laughs> like it's I, i'm really german now so in my head it sounds perfect but the moment yeah. i try to say it it's like oh my goodness yeah. what was what was that you know yeah and like i don't know if you have ever um sung like if you ever took singing classes or anything as a kid uh but i i had to take some singing when i was um in school and um that's always like wild it's the same situation where in your head it sounds like you're totally on key uh, correct notes and doing the exact same thing as Mm -hmm. like the cd or whatever you're doing and then you listen to a recording of yourself and you sound like like a dying chicken or something and you're like what is even happening right right right, yeah yeah i mean it's just it's uh yeah it's 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 tough because so I've talked about it many times, but basically the way I learned English, I mean, I, I had it, I had English in school, high school, and throughout the entire education system for 50 years. And basically I wasn't able to communicate after all those years. I could pass any pretty much any grammar exam, but I just couldn't mm-hmm. communicate. And when I started uh, reading Crashing's books, I started researching and started my project. In hindsight, I realized that what helped me was watching the NBA. Because yeah. I, I liked I liked basketball, I still do. Mm-hmm. And I started watching it in English because I love the sport, but you know, I sort of had the hope that it was gonna help me out. But it wasn't the main thing for me. And then when I moved to Poland for the first time, like on an exchange year, Everything was in English. I mean, here is, uh, they speak Polish, but classes were in English. Uh, my friends were from other countries in Europe for the most part, so we communicated in English. And I could communicate. And like, and like some of my Spanish friends <laughs> who went through the same education system but didn't do the, set, the, the, the MBA part, right? So it was like, like I said, like it all made sense to me. But recently I realized that in my city before that experience, because I always thought that 
my first year in Poland was the first time I really had to use it in real life. But I actually realized that I used to, like when going out in my city, I'm from a small town in Spain, so it, there's not a lot of foreigners there and so on. Mm -hmm. But there used to be a guy from Nigeria that I, I used to bump into him, like just in parties. And I remember trying to talk to him in English and, and being able to actually. And you know, when you're, when you're in a party, when you've drunk something that you lose the, the, the fear of making errors yeah. and so on, but I could communicate. So I wonder if those early experiences, no, I wonder, no, I'm pretty, now I'm pretty much sure that that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Because again, back to the, to the same topic. Yeah. I just feel like, mm, there's got to be a way to practice output, not just rely on naturally being able to communicate through input only. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wonder if, if there's something. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no. I mean, it does seem like, at least unless they're lying, which is always possible, but I'm, I doubt it, it does seem like for some people it does just start to spontaneously you know, come forth, but I don't think that happens for everybody. Um, I think it, it probably just depends on the person. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, what the difference is or why it seems to work for some people and not others. Not that I don't think that it works, but the, the speaking spontaneously doesn't seem to happen for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, obviously it's going to work eventually, but I do feel like there has to be some, yeah, like you were saying, some training mechanism to, to help it along right. because, you know, people speak at different ages in their first language. Like it takes some people, you know, a couple more years than other people, uh -huh. but it's not, you know, most people barring some kind of, you know, intellectual, dif you know, disability or something like that don't have a long difference. You know, it's, it's a short, a short gap. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously there's always, I mean, there's always people who don't care about making mistakes and authors that do a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I probably put myself in the second category, uh, for the most part, mm -hmm. but yeah, cause I, even, even the kids thing that, I, you know, I, I used to, again, I used to believe that, and I still believe it, that is through input that they develop the ability to communicate. But when they start, um, they start saying their first words, that's output, right? So, you know, can you tell if it's only a consequence of the input they got or, or, you know, by actually starting to utter those words, they're actually practicing or they're getting used to saying it or they're, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know? And yeah, yeah, it's the, that's what I'm thinking about recently. And I was wondering if there's anything you're doing, if you're feeling the same way, is there anything you're trying to do like shadowing, like you said, or anything that you've been reading about that you think could work or. Yeah, I think, um, I do notice, and like you were saying with the, um, the self-consciousness like some people not caring about making mistakes and some people caring i definitely care not in a like a way of i'm embarrassed or whatever oh, although no. obviously sometimes i'm embarrassed but more that like to some extent it just feels like i could have done this from the beginning you know like it's annoying to have the correct language in your head and not be able to say it correctly Whereas like if I were in the speak from day one camp of like language learning, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't care about making mistakes because it's, that's just the, the name of the game. Like that's what you're supposed to be doing is speaking yeah. and making mistakes and correcting them. And that, that's how they, you know, believe that the language learning works. But like, you know, if you've done all the comprehensible input and stuff and you know, you're years in, it's frustrating to still be making really basic errors so it's more it's like a perfectionism thing I think for me uh -huh. but I do have a lot less of that self-consciousness if I am just speaking to myself like 
uh, I will have monologues in my car or something like that where I'm, you know, totally by myself and able to just speak. And partially, I think that's easier because you're choosing the topic. And so you're talking about something that you're already thinking about. You're already, you know, having all these thoughts. Um, And also, usually it requires a lot less uh, grammar, I want to say, like mm-hmm. speaking classes or like group classes, you know, they're trying to get you to use conjugation and different verb tenses and moods and everything. Right. So that's the primary focus of what you're practicing, which makes mistakes much more continuous than if mm-hmm. you're just like saying general truths about the world, then you're, you know, not necessarily using like, you know, two Segus and all of these, you know, like just different conjugations. I don't know if what I'm saying makes any sense, but yeah, I think the kind of idea of just speaking on my own more has helped me be a little bit more spontaneous in speaking. And then, yeah, I am trying to write more as well because practicing, you know, thinking of what to say in Spanish without having that pressure of needing to actually say it right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating thing. Like, I mean it. <laughs> but yeah. it, it, it is it is frustrating at times because I, I get what you're saying. Like, and the... Because I was just thinking that I'm actually kind of okay with making mistakes. What bothers me the most is not having the spontaneity, like you said, or the fluency, mm-hmm. or not not being able to come up with sentences on the fly. You know, because I've, I've talked about it many times that the way I sort of measure or, I, or, I, or I, that I know that I'm starting to get to a point in which I could be able to communicate is because I start imagining conversations in my head, mm-hmm. right? And it, again, it's the same thing. In my head, it sounds great, you know, it like, and again, that's through input only, mm-hmm. right? So that's why I know that that works because yeah. with German, I'm starting to see that, that I'm starting to imagine situations in my head. So if, and I, I don't even do it on purpose. It just comes, you know, it just, I'm, so I'm listening to a podcast and I imagine having conversations with that guest. You know, in my head, and things start to come to my head. But then, if you actually try to use it in real life, man, it's just not ah, like that. The fluency, for the most part, is like having to sometimes think about what you're gonna say and things like that. And or because the mistakes, they are frustrating, of course, but um, I kind of trust input. A hundred percent in that sense, meaning that I know mm-hmm. I'm gonna correct it if that makes sense, or or that's gonna come with time. I'm okay, like I said, with making mistakes, as long as I'm I can communicate what I want to say in a fluent way, like I'm doing now in English. I'm okay with it, mm-hmm. and I I know I'm I'm not using a hundred percent the perfect sentence, and you know, but I'm I feel totally free when speaking the language. I I can talk about anything I want to talk about. Um, in a fluent way, I, I don't need to stop to think about. I might have to stop to th- to to talk about specific things or to put it to put them in a more clear way. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But I feel free with the language. That's how I, how yeah. I explain it. But it that it does no, no. doesn't happen with other languages. That's the what bothers me a little. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, in the thinking about how to put things, you know, most people will have to do that at times with their native language as well. So it's, you know, it might be slightly more often, but it's still, it's a completely natural human thing to have to do so. And I think that is something that can also happen is people can be more critical of themselves in their target languages Hmm. because they're primed to be when in reality they may be having that exact same experience in their native language and not even realizing it. Um, but yeah, I think, um, Oh, we got a card in the podcast. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, she has great language learning abilities. Uh, Good. probably does, doesn't care about mistakes, right? No. 
<laughs> she shows up in all of my Spanish classes. Um, and so they, you know, are always joking about her and that she's the trilingual cat because she speaks English, gato, y espanol. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, the mistakes, I think, yeah, I think I feel similarly in, yes, it's annoying to make like the grammar mistakes or whatever, but it's far more, feels far more, I don't know, hopeless or like impotent or something when you are just sitting there like wheels spinning because mm. you know what you want to say, but you cannot come up with the way right. to say it. Right. That feels much more hopeless than just, oh, I said that wrong. I need to like, yeah. and they tell you how to say it. And then you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Even many times, five seconds later, you, you think to yourself like there, I, I knew how to say that. Why didn't <laughs> come out of my mouth that way? <laughs> yep. And so that's, that's when, when you started learning Spanish, that's when you decided to start your YouTube channel. Or because you said you started with the first one about books and language learning, and now you're yeah. focusing more on language learning itself, right? Mm -hmm. what, so, what's your What's your goal with your channel? Yeah, or it was basically, I think, I think it was January of 2021, and so yeah, I started um, with both. I kind of wanted to have like you know no niche or whatever, um, but then. And I also didn't really feel like I had enough to say about language learning to have a language learning channel because like I, here I was trying to learn my first foreign language to fluency ever and I didn't know what I was doing and I wasn't even that committed at that point. And so I mostly just talked about like the materials that I was using, you know, if I was like trying out an app or a like a graded reader or something like that. So it was kind of more just like, here's what I am doing. Um, and then occasional like language learning blogs, but mostly I talked about books probably a lot more for the first year. And then it was, I think it was November of 2021 that I did a challenge for myself, just trying to do one hour of languages every day for the month and that was by far way more than I had been doing prior to that and far more consistently and so that was kind of where I really had a breakthrough um and I can't remember I think it may have been a couple more months before I made the channel that's explicitly about language learning but yeah and that was an hour a day of Spanish only or I started that month trying to do German and Spanish. Okay. And I think it was during that month that I decided I'm really not going to make progress until I focus on one thing for a while. <laughs> and I still have ever uh, since then struggled to add another language back in um, because, again, with the amount of time that it takes, it just has been difficult to balance. But I think I've successfully added Portuguese in now, which was not the plan at all. It was sort of accidental, but, you know, it is so similar to Spanish that it's very easy to jump straight into mm -hmm. media and stuff. So it's been a very smooth transition. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, that's always um, like a dilemma for me because, again, back to your point, it's it's... It's a matter of time in the end, right? I mean, there's other things, and w that's what we're trying to guess here, but <laughs> what we're trying to talk about here, but at the end of the day, it's a matter of time. And, you know, I, I used to learn like six, seven different languages every day mm -hmm. or, or get input in those languages. And I loved it, but obviously 20 minutes a day is not the same as the three hours I've been doing with German this year. Mm -hmm. So that that's going to make a difference, right? But yeah. there's always, I always had that dilemma because now that I think about it, like being honest with myself, I enjoyed that for the the other way more than, than what I'm doing with German now. Mm -hmm. um, but also because when it comes to Italian, French, Portuguese, I can understand pretty much anything. So the types of resources that I'm watching or that I'm reading are way more interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah. 
But even now that I'm, I've gotten to a point in which I can understand really complex videos in German, not mm -hmm. not at the same point, of course, yeah, not even with Polish, but uh, I mean at the same uh, level that I can understand Polish, but you know, more interesting stuff than cartoons or things of the nature. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but yeah, I'm just working on understanding how to bridge that gap between input and output because. Yeah, that's the, the main thing that I don't really have an answer for yet, or a definite answer for, but yeah. Cool. Oh, and is there, right, you mentioned Portuguese, right? So I get, I guess that's the first time you tried to learn the language purely with the incomprehensible input. Like, well, what I mean is with Spanish, once you realize once you came across comprehensible input that it made sense for you you started trying to learn the language that way, right? But you did have some previous experience with the traditional way. So, you know, it can always, it can always fool you for a while. You know what I mean? Like you, you never know what part helped me the most or what, to what yeah. percentage, you know, but I guess with Portuguese, it's been pure input, right? Yes. Yeah. And I even like, I have access to the refold 30-day language course in order to do a review of it and i even initially was going to do that in portuguese um okay. and then i was looking at it and they do kind of recommend you know looking into the, uh, the alphabet how the letters are pronounced in different situations and eventually a little bit of grammar and i even decided to not do it in portuguese to do it in a different language instead because I really don't want to know that in mm. Portuguese. Like, mm. I just want to keep that completely. And I, it still won't be like a great experiment because of how similar it is to Spanish. Like, right. it's it's still going to have some of that influence. But I was like, this is, I have like, it's like a buy one, get one free language for me. Like, I don't need to study it at all. And so I was like, I don't want to introduce any of that kind of knowledge um, and just see how it goes. And I mean, I do feel like for the most part, the, the, the looking up the letters and stuff with how they, what sounds they make, I feel like I already can usually look at a word in Portuguese and see, know how it would be pronounced based mm -hmm. on just input so far. So I, yeah, it just feels very unnecessary for that language. Whereas, you know, if I was doing korean or something like that I, like i probably would look up how the alphabet is pronounced and everything i mean i've already done that in the past because i dabbled in korean but you know if it was something drastically different i probably would try to take some of those more shortcut kind of things but anyway mm. yeah I, i've seen some uh, some videos on your channel talking about korean so is that a language that you're looking to learn now or I did in the past. Um, so I have read a bit of Korean literature, trans you know, translated into English, and I really, really liked it. And okay. I was very interested in like the history of the country and kind of the culture. Um, so I did dabble in it for uh, probably a couple months and I could like, you know, read as in I could look at a word and sound it out and that sort of thing. But um, it was another situation where I ha had to kind of decide whether I was going to focus on Spanish or keep, you know, doing all these other uh, interesting little things. And so I did decide to just put it down and only do Spanish. But I, I'm kind of glad that that happened because although I think Korean is really uh, such a cool language and uh, mm -hmm. I'm interested in it from an academic standpoint, I guess you could say. Ultimately, it's it's a you know quite a difficult language, quite a time intensive language to learn, and I would be more interested in spending that time on Mandarin probably if I was going to learn more of a different language okay. than um, the ones that I'm already learning. So I'm kind of glad that it didn't work out at the time, but it would be really fun to learn. So never say never. <laughs> Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with those languages, I always feel like the time I would need to learn one of those languages, I could learn like two or three European ones. <laughs> yes. So, 
Yeah, it does but, turn into a bit of a numbers game eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also a bit of a challenge at the same time. So that makes it attractive, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, but also it's, I think it's important what you said about Portuguese, that because it's similar to Spanish, I, I always feel like I want to do an experiment with a language that not completely different. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to do it with a language that uses the same alphabet, so it doesn't have that extra layer mm -hmm. of complexity, but it's totally different to any of the languages that I speak, like, I don't know, Hungarian or Finnish or Turkish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, at the same time, even though I really don't believe in, I mean, the the same way I'm talking about trying to understand how to bridge the gap between input and output, I, I don't think speaking from day one would be helpful, like right now. Yeah. But um, I feel like uh, like a combination of, well, Input first, obviously, but maybe later on some output like the things we talked about. But I I'm mostly curious to try just what if you start speaking from day one? Obviously, I mean, not with people in the street, but shadowing or listening and repeat, things like that from day one. Because mm -hmm. if you do it, I, I feel like if you do it with a language like that, there's no excuse. You know you know what I mean? Like there's no, not, not excuse, not the right word. If you do it with Portuguese, people can always say, or you can always tell yourself that, oh, it, it's because it's similar to Spanish, right? But if yeah. you do it with Hungarian, there's nothing else to give the credit to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do it this way and it works, it really does work. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. I think, I feel like, but speaking from day one, like, I don't believe in fossilization, like, the thing that people always say about wow. how it'll ruin your accent or whatever. Right. I don't, I don't, I feel like I haven't seen any studies that back right. that up, and I don't, I don't believe that. I think it's more that people, some people don't have a good ear for whether they're making a mistake or a mistake like i don't think it's a mistake it's just a different way to pronounce it mm -hmm. um some people don't care which is totally valid yeah. and some people are really self-conscious about mimicking like mm. you know this is i'm sure this is a thing in you know spanish high schools with english class as well it's big oh, yeah. for sure in the you know spanish class for teenagers they're embarrassed to say it the right way. Like, even if they can yep, say yep, yep, yep. the right way, it's embarrassing. Like, you know, and so I think mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that with adults too. Like, it's okay. hard to put yourself into the character to say it correctly. Mm -hmm. And I've I've definitely heard Stephen Crush and talk about that in interviews before of how, like, you know, if I moved to Ireland tomorrow, I'm not picking up an Irish accent. It doesn't probably matter how long I live there. I'm probably never going to speak with an Irish accent because right. I don't identify as Irish. And so I'm going to continue identifying with my existing accent. Hmm. And so I think that's like a huge thing as well. But I forget where I was going with this now. But yeah, I don't think that speaking from one day one is harmful necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think some people will find it really motivational and some people will not. Oh. And then it's just a matter of whether you're doing other things on top of it to yeah. get that required input. Like if it if it helps motivate you, then I think people should absolutely do it. I just don't think they should depend on that teaching them the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, this is yeah, it's obviously I was gonna say that the one thing I'm sure of, but I mean, the way I've changed my mind about that part recently, I, I'm never going to say anything. <laughs> no, but what, what I mean is, uh, I'm pretty much sure that without the input, the input part is never going to happen. Yeah. Like, there's no way around it. Because that's, to put it into simple words, that's how you get the language into your head. Like, you can, mm -hmm. I mean, you can memorize things and say them out loud, but... If, if the language is not in your head, you're not really understanding what's going on. If people uh, reply to that 
thing that you said, you're not going to have any idea what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just, yeah, it's driving me a little bit crazy recently. Mm -hmm. that I, I don't seem to understand, you know, a hundred percent of how, how that works, how to bridge that gap. Yeah. I think it's kind of, I've talked about this before with my sister who is a sign language interpreter. Mm. And so she learned sign language in the space of like two years, like very, very intense classroom based education. And they encouraged them to, you know, basically get input, which is relatively difficult to do in sign language because not that many mm. like not that many videos exist. Um, but you know, some, um, but it was primarily practice based, you know, speak from day one kind of things. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I've talked with her before about kind of whether that's any different than learning a spoken language and how that kind of Mm -hmm. uh process worked for her and i think i feel the same way maybe about spoken languages is that like you can like brute force construct a building with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instruction i mean that's kind of like how you learned english um is like you like put up all the pillars by hand you know built all the structure and then you kind of backfill that later with the input but in the meantime, you're able to kind of use the language. You're just not using it very comfortably necessarily, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not very naturally. Um, but it does allow you to use it right away. Whereas like input, you can't necessarily use it right away. Um, cause I was asking her if she felt like when she first graduated and, you know, started using it, if she felt like she was fluent and she said, no, not necessarily like it was very formulaic for a while and then it was kind of after it just like gradually turned into natural spontaneous use rather than having to think of how to do everything right. so yeah i think again there's kind of i my problem kind of with the comprehensible input community in general i just feel like there's a lot of like scare tactics kind of about like doing things wrong like you're gonna ruin your right. language forever Right. if you do certain things and while i do think that like my spanish classes did to some extent harm my spanish yeah i don't think there is like you can't ruin it like you're never gonna make it so that it's impossible for you to learn you're never gonna ruin your mm -hmm. accent you're never gonna do anything that makes it impossible for you to be fluent later mm -hmm. like i just feel like there's a lot of like different conspiracy theories of like ways that you can mess it up and i just feel like eventually all of these ways are going to equalize if you keep going and you keep getting enough right of the language it all equals out i don't know mm -hmm. yeah i think it can if uh, but the motivation standpoint maybe i mean like because uh, in, in my case for whatever reason i was so passionate about languages that i kept trying Right, right. Even if sometimes I didn't mean to. <laughs> Back to the MBA example. But sometimes if you're not that passionate, you're trying to learn a language, the traditional way is not working. You know, you might just end up giving up forever. Yeah. So it's not going to ruin your actual language skills or your actual ability, but it can from that uh, point of view, right? But yeah, I think like, I agree with doing that part. Then, um, this you know you can always try different things. But I, I really feel like doing an experiment. Like I said, not speaking from the one in real life because I feel like that'd be awkward. <laughs> but from day one, combining both, so starting with input, but then the thing we talked about shadowing, listen, repeat, but with focus and meaning. And what I mean by that is. And not going to repeat sentences like a power and not knowing what they mean. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like a, a combination of both. I feel like it could be interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it could be useful. I mean, it could work. I, I have that feeling recently back to the doubts that I'm, I'm having recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I think that could be a back to the brains working differently. I think that could be kind of a way around. I get the feeling that people who say that like the language just comes out spontaneously Mm -hmm. are thinking in that language and therefore it's coming out because they've had those thoughts and like if you're thinking in that language, that's essentially output. You're just not actually speaking it. Like it's not physical mm-hmm. output, but it's mm-hmm. mental output. Mm-hmm. Whereas I don't have any mental output unless I am doing it on purpose. Like I don't, Okay. I wouldn't ever like spontaneously think something in Spanish and ever. Okay. I don't do that in English either. So I think the shadowing mm-hmm. and repeating things could potentially be the substitute for that mm-hmm. or consciously being like, I'm going to try to think in Spanish for a while, but yeah, I don't know. That's very interesting. Yeah, that, it is interesting. I like, I like the idea of the repeating things that have meaning. Cause I feel like children do that all the time. Like saying, as soon as you say something and they like what you said, and they'll just keep repeating that. Like, they're like, oh, that's a good, fr-. you know, you can see in their little minds. So like, I right. like that phrase. And then they just keep saying it. So right. that feels like a very natural thing to do. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, it makes sense what you're saying about different brains. Because to me, I do feel like output starts to come out spontaneously in all those languages. I mean, it does come out. But mm-hmm. I just don't feel it's as fluent that, as I think. Yeah, I don't like the word should be, but because uh, it's a dangerous word. But yeah, expect you know, is expected yeah, to be. Yeah, but honestly, because, you know, sometimes, in my, like I said at the beginning, if I'm six months in, it, it's not realistic to feel like you're going to be able to speak fluently, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm getting the feeling that you know, I can, like all those languages that I talked about, like Polish, Italian, Portuguese, French, I can communicate in all of those languages. Um, some better than others, of course, but in all of them, you know, in the informal situations, I, I can communicate in mm, like no worries, no, no problem getting my point across and everything. But I feel like the fluency is not there. Mm-hmm. No, I still, depending on the topic we're talking about or the situation, because then obviously uh, another important thing to me is if it's a one-on-one conversation, you usually feel more relaxed than the group setting. Mm-hmm. And th- I think those things play a role, but still for the most part, I feel like I can communicate, but I'm not where I would like to be looking at the time I've been listening to the language. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because obviously we don't really know, like we're, um, we're all tracking the time. I I saw one video of yours that you said that you stopped doing it. (laughs) You're going to talk about it in a moment, but I, I, I do it because, you know, I want to have a blueprint or I want to help, I want to help people, you know, with realistic realistic expectations on how much time it could take but um oh i i don't know what i was going to say no i completely forgot anyway <laughs> but yeah the main thing is i feel like there could be something that could be done like also the mental part is important obviously like some people don't care about we talked about making mistakes on things of the nature while others do. Um, mm-hmm. But I just, yeah, it's just some internal feeling that something could be done to just improve output, improve the way you can really make it more natural. Like yeah. feel, feel the way I feel when I speak English, which is not perfect, obviously. I'm not a native speaker, but again, I, I don't know how to put it into words, but in my head is clear. You know, like mm-hmm. the, yeah, free, I think it the makes... freedom I have when, when speaking English versus the somewhat freedom I have when speaking those other languages. Mm-hmm. 
But I think it helps that you do have a language that's not your native language that you're fluent in to compare to, to be like, this is, I'm not at where I know that I could be even yeah. through learning through like a, you know, quote unquote, suboptimal way, <laughs> you know, to know that what that feels like and like what you're trying to get to, I think, you know, is really valuable because I don't have that to compare to. I just know that I don't like learning that. And then you'll have people telling you like, oh, well, that's natural. You know, that's normal. And that's like, well, yes, I know. But how do I fix it? <laughs> right. How do I get right. past it? Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, it is normal, but to a certain extent, right? Because, yeah. But the thing, yeah, I like what you said, because to me, that's the because of the way I can communicate in English, I know, first of all, that it can be done. I know that it's not a talent thing. Like it might take less time or more time for some people, but what I mean is that we, we can all get it done because I vividly remember not being able to communicate in English at all after all those years in the education system. Like I really, I really do. So I know it can be done. I know, um, Everyone can do it. I'm pretty convinced about that. I always talk about it because I've left it. But yeah, that's the, the second part I'm trying to figure out. But you know, after all this, I was going to say rant, it's not really a rant. <laughs> after everything that we've been talking about, I'm sure, you know, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll research, I'll read, I'll talk to people. This is the, the part that the, the piece that is missing for me that when it comes to understanding how the whole process works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a big gap in general in just what you hear, even people who have experts on their channel or whatever talk about. I feel like we rehash the input part of it a lot. And then when they talk about output, it's always, well, that will come naturally with enough input. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, not necessarily the case. And also yeah. even like, you can still talk about it, even if it does eventually come naturally, like mm -hmm. what are the different steps that you can anticipate happening and like all of these different things. Um, but yeah, it does seem to be a huge gap in the conversation for sure. It is. It is. And I've been guilty of that, to be honest, <laughs> of, of, of talking about that, that it's going to come mm -hmm. naturally and things like that. I mean, well intended, like I didn't mean to lie. Is this what I believe? Is what I thought, but I'm interested in the truth. And this is what's going through my chemicals right now. This is what's, you know, so that's why I'm talking about it recently. I'm, I started talking about this specific thing more often because that's what I'm feeling with my own process, my own journey. So I'm, because I, I'm interested, yeah, just to um, finish my thought, because I'm interested in, like I said, in helping people. Like, uh, I mean, I really am <laughs> um, after myself, you know, after understanding how it works for myself, I, I want, I want to talk about it. I want to figure it out, you know, and I, I, I don't feel comfortable now saying that, oh, it's going to come out naturally for sure with only input because now I'm not sure mm -hmm. I, I was before, even though I could be wrong, but I, that's what I thought, but yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> it's like, it is a minor, not a minor piece of it, but like, I think people are thinking of, oh, well, if you spend a thousand hours, 2,000, 7,000 hours doing input, then, you know, even if it takes 200 or 300 hours of input or output, I'm sorry, um, to get comfortable, then that's such a, you know, small piece of mm -hmm. the pie or whatever, right. which is true. And I do still think it is probably accurate. Like I, I think it's probably going to take way fewer hours, but a hundred hours of output feels way harder than a thousand hours of input. Like, oh, yeah. So much more intense to yeah. practice, but so I don't think you can just sweep it under the rug, you know, no. and say, oh, well, it's such a minor part of the process. 
when yes, in total number of hours, it, it probably, I think probably will end up being, but it's also, it's kind of like when you first start out getting to 50 hours of input mm. is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. And then that just continues, you know, to get easier and easier as yep. you go along. Yeah. Getting the, the, the hours of output feels similar to getting those first hours of input where every single minute is just way more intense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Any final message after everything we talked about? Any final message for language learner? Language learners out there? Um, yeah, I think mostly just, I feel like as we've talked about, paying attention to that motivation piece of it, like making sure that what you're doing, you're actually enjoying you, um, regardless of kind of the methodology that you're following. You know, I think it's important to try to do effective things, obviously, mm -hmm. but to, to keep in mind that things aren't, you know, efficient to do if you're not enjoying doing them, if you're not engaged yeah. with them, you know, if, if learner content doesn't work for you, you know, it, native content may be better, even if it's too hard. And on the flip side, the, if native content makes you really frustrated, then don't use it until you're farther along, you know, like just paying attention to that aspect of it um, for me has been important. Yeah. I like it. I like, yeah, enjoying the process. That's so important. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, from my side, I'd say that I still believe in comprehensive input. <laughs> you know, I still <laughs> believe it's that's the only, uh, it's just not the only, I mean, that you can't get it done without it. But we'll we'll keep investigating on that output part. <laughs> I look forward to your the results of your investigations. Yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> and yeah, of course, you know, I'll leave links to your channel in the description and everywhere, so people can check it out. And yeah, thank you, Yo. It's it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. So have a good day and see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks so much for watching this interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. And uh, if you want to know more about language learning, language acquisition, like, you know, what's, what's the best way to learn a language, ideas for language learning, uh, the best resources at different levels here. You can find the whole playlist with all the interviews I've done so far with different researchers, teachers, polyglots, and so on. And finally, right here, you smash this guy right in the face to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.